right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Dana Frank. We're at Bar Norman in Portland. It's March 3rd, 2022. Dana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, first and biggest question to start is why wine? Goodness. Um, well, my real like love and passion for wine came out of an earlier love and passion for food and cooking. And um, that was the path that I was on and thought would be my career path was um, working with food. Um, and I uh, started after um, college, I was in the Peace Corps in Romania and um, was there for three and a half years. And um, when I was coming to the end of my time there, I wasn't quite sure what the next step was going to be. But I have always had a great love of food and cooking and grew up with parents who were great cooks. And um, after spending that much time living in Eastern Europe and learning to shop from the markets and cook really what was like seasonal, local, in every sense of the word, I thought that that might be a good path for me. I really didn't know what I wanted to do next. And um, so while I was still there, I had applied to culinary school and um, got into California culinary and thought that I was going to come back and move to the Bay Area. And I got my first tuition bill and it had so many zeros at the end of it. And after (laughs) living um, in Eastern Europe on basically like a, it wasn't a salary, but you know, like a volunteer stipend for that long, I just didn't even know how to comprehend that amount of money. And, um, and it became clear to me really quickly that that just like wasn't going to be an option. And at the time my parents were living in central Oregon and Bend and I went back to visit them and, um, very just coincidentally was introduced to a chef who had a restaurant there and I got to talking about oh I was going to go to culinary school but I decided you know I can't do it right now and he said oh well I probably wouldn't recommend you to go to culinary school anyway it's so expensive and you could just learn what you needed to learn by working just in a kitchen so you know why don't you come basically offered me a stage and I came and worked at, in his kitchen for, you know, like a couple of weeks and then was offered a job there. And so I spent a year and a half working um, at the restaurant in the kitchen, um, working the line and learning pastries and was the pastry chef there for the last like half of my time working at that restaurant. But it, for me, it was an amazing experience and it um, still like parlays into how I cook now, which is like with a very adventurous spirit and Uh, clean as I go mentality like some of the really great things about working in kitchens stuck with me Um, but I also learned that it was just like not a space that I felt really great I didn't feel like myself I was very like cooped up working with the same three people working hellacious hours for no money and um, what I I remember so clearly is like I would make a dish and I would see it on the plate and it looked so great and then it would go out the door and I would never (laughs) know like did did people enjoy it what was their reaction and I so badly wanted that part of what I was doing and um I'm such an extrovert that I it just became really clear to me that the kitchen was not the place that I could stay Um, but I'm to this day so entirely grateful for that experience because it really set me on this path to like where I've gone in my career in my life my passion for food and wine so I'm really grateful that I did it, and I'm also grateful that I only did it for like a year and a half. Um, but that led me to another restaurant um, also down in Bend, which has since closed, but at the time in the like early 2000s was um, the place to eat food and drink wine in Bend. Um, there was a lot of money in, uh, there still is, but at the time there was a lot of money rolling in from California, a lot of investment. And um, I fell into this restaurant where I started working like lunch shifts front of house and that led to dinner shifts, which led to becoming more involved with learning about wine. And um, it was just such a highlight of my life working there. So I was there for, um, I don't know, a year, year and a half. Um, But the wine program was something I'd never experienced before. And in my mind at that time, wine was really for like old white guys in like suits you know and there wasn't space in wine nor was anybody working in wine who looked like me was a young woman um, or looked like any of the other people that were running the wine program at that restaurant who were all like 
like Tim Rippa. <laughs> uh, that's where Tim and I met. Um, and I remember just thinking like, whoa, there are really cool people working in wine. And I just had no idea whatsoever. So we actually, Tim and um, one of the other servers at the restaurant started a, like a wine study group. And um, we bought, we all bought like these big, huge books that we studied from and we would get together and blind taste wines. And that was sort of like the beginning of the end for me. I was like, this is felt to me like I can never learn all the things there are to learn. And that was the most intriguing part of it. Also having this real connection to farming, to again, to food, to restaurants, to hospitality, it sort of tied in all of the things that were some of my like greatest interests and passions, but I had never considered making a career out of. Um, I remember a specific moment in, in my like mid twenties at that time where I thought, I, could I just like work in hospitality? Is that, is that a, like an appropriate career? And how would I like tell people that that's what I'm doing? And now of course, fast forward like 20 years and I'm like, well, duh, <laughs> of course you can. But, um, but it was a real like eye opening for me just seeing how many like cool young people were getting into wine at that time. And to, to have access to wines, you know, I, I mean, I was tasting stupid stuff I did, that I just didn't even realize were like important wines in like the, you know, world of um, great wines. I just had no idea that's what I was tasting, you know? And I was um, tasting a lot of like Oregon specific wines, again, just like Beaufrere, like verticals of Beaufrere, Irie, um, Archery, so a lot of the like, uh, you know, bigger named wines at the time were on our list there. And so I just had a lot of exposure to that kind of stuff. And again, like I said, it just was, some of it was really just lost on me because I didn't know, I didn't know enough yet, Mm -hmm. you know? But that was basically, like I said, the beginning of the end and I never really left wine after that. I did leave Bend because I, I always had ambitions of leaving, you know, and it, my intention was to like go back and visit my parents after the Peace Corps and then I stuck around there for a few years. But my intention was always to like leave. I didn't know Portland was going to be the place, but I wanted to go somewhere else. And um, so once I had this great wine foundation and good support behind me, I thought Portland made the most sense to kind of launch here and, um, and to see if I could make a go. I had started at that time studying um, for the Court of Master Sommelier, the Court of Master Sommelier's um, track, and I had taken the first two exams through the track, and that's when I decided to move to Portland. And then also decided um, through that, it took me a couple more years to not continue pursuing the court. Um, it just didn't really fit with like my feelings about wine and the philosophy that I believed in. But again, the foundation and the the access to wine and um, sort of the motivation to study was really great. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so then I came to Portland and um, since I've been here, it's been a a real like, I've done a little bit of everything. My heart is always in hospitality, for sure. Um, I love taking care of people. I love service. Um, I love creating an experience. Um, But I've done, you know, Scott and I met working in on the wine aisle at New Seasons and um, I've worked at our own winery at other wineries doing harvest I've done um, wholesale importing carried a bag and delivered wine and I've done it all so (laughs) but this is where my heart always came back to in between all of those different experiences was like hospitality is the thing that gives me I think the most satisfaction and enjoyment it also pushes me the most Mm -hmm. and so um, I wanted to learn a lot of different aspects of the business to sort of figure out like where I wanted to to fall Um, but I always came back here so and it's interesting because when we started bow and arrow in 2010 I thought well that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna be part of bow and arrow it just kind of made sense Mm -hmm. I think in my mind I was like well this is what we would do it's a family business And I really struggled like trying to find my way there for a good year and a half. And then it became increasingly clear that like that wasn't the right fit for me and that I do so much better like in this not in a cellar making wine and being wet and dirty all the time. But um, and not that there's anything wrong with those things. It just wasn't again like 
what brought me the most satisfaction. So I'm back up for a second to, to your, to your initial decision to pursue wine education, to yeah. pursue the CMS. Uh, I'm curious from, from the, from the moment that wine became part of your life at, at this restaurant and you started to kind of dive down the rabbit hole, what, what was, what was the educational process for you like then before it became formal? And what inspired you to, to pursue formal education? Mm -hmm. So at the time, um, we had the study group at the restaurant I was working at, and we, we all had um, a book called, I think it's um, Andre Domine. I can't remember if that's his last name, but the book is just called Wine, and it was a huge text. So we each had a copy of that, and um, we would pick a section and kind of read it um, and then get together and blind taste wines from that kind of region of the world. So it was all self-study at that point. Um, and I would take that book and a highlighter and a pen and I would go sit in a cafe and just highlight and read and write notes. And I still have the book because um, I don't reference it anymore, but it's just like looking back at those very early days when I didn't even know that this would become my career. It's pretty cool to look back and like look at my notes in the margins about Chateauneuf du Pop and, you know, um, Tokai. And so, um, so yeah, it was all self-study. And then with that group, we would blind taste together. And, but I, I remember just like eating up as much information as I could, just like wherever I could find it, collecting books, tons of reading, um, tasting when I could. And again, the wine program at this restaurant was just really broad. And so we had a lot of um, access to very cool wines from all over the place. So very supportive of Oregon wines, of course, but it was my very first introduction to wines from, you know, Italy and Spain and France. And we offered lots of wine flights. So there was just tons of opportunity to constantly be tasting. Um, yeah, previous to that, I, I really just did not have any wine experience. I was, I was the girl in college who would show up to a party with a bottle of um, Vendage or, but I would show up with a big bottle of that to a college party. Everybody else was there for the keg and, you know, the jungle juice and whatever, but I was showing up with the wine. But that had been my, the extent of my, like, interest in wine or knowledge about wine. I certainly wasn't drinking it when I was living overseas, which now, of course, I look back and it's like such a shame. But um, yeah, like my t experience was really informed by that time working at that restaurant. Um, and I think there's something in my blood that is very competitive and wants to push myself to do things that I think I might not be able to do. And it's been a common thread through my whole life. And so I think the court felt like such an unattainable thing like at that time I think Alpana Singh was the only female um, master in the country the youngest and the only you know she wasn't the only female but she was certainly the youngest mm -hmm. and I just remember thinking like that's amazing and also crazy that you know there's so few women involved with this mm -hmm. so I think that's what pushed me and motivated me was like here's a goal see if you can shoot for it and I didn't really know a whole lot about the program at the time but there was something about being certified and kind of doing the studying it was all self-study there weren't classes so it was doing the studying sitting for the exam having to be prepared that um, really spoke to me um, yeah so it was all self-study really so many people had asked me to, like, once I moved to Portland and I started working as a, as a sommelier and a wine director, like, where my wine education was and did I go to school, and it all was self-study and then on-the-job experience. Well, let's talk about that then. You, you moved to Portland, you're not exactly sure mm -hmm. what that means yet, um, and you're in the middle of educating yourself about wine. So what was, the, what was your first, first step here? So the first thing I did is I... Um, because Bend and Portland had like a pretty decent connection, um, even back then, you had a lot of people that worked for wineries in the valley here that would come to Bend. You know, the, they were selling wine in Bend, and same with wine distributors. So I had the opportunity to meet some people that were based out of Portland, but that would come over, pour wines, were selling wine from their winery. And um, so I met someone who had worked really long term at Argyle. 
and I said, hey, I'm moving over to Portland, and I really want to work Harvest somewhere. I feel like that's the next step for me. And um, so he was like, oh, you should, you know, totally apply to work Harvest at Argyle. So I did that. I moved to Portland, and I, went, I mean, within like two months, went to work and did Harvest at Argyle, and did the commute back and forth. And that was just, you know, I knew nothing about working in a winery and what that labor entails and how hard it is. Um, so I did that right away, and then um, I think my next move after that was just peddling my resume around town and looking for a SOM job. Um, I, everything that I understood about the court was like you're training to become a sommelier, to like be buttoned up and on the floor and taking wine out to people, and, um, and so that was what I thought I needed to do. And so I took my resume out, peddled it around. I had like this really nice printed resume in a very fancy envelope. I wanted something that would be eye catching and took it out. Um, and I, um, ended up, uh, working for Bruce Carey at 23 Hoyt, right when 23 Hoyt opened. So it had been a different restaurant previously called Volvo and Volvo closed, um, 23 Hoyt opened and, um, Chris Israel was the chef there. And so I worked um, with Chris and the team there and um, managed and took on the wine program. And it was sort of my first, at first I was just managing and then was able to take on the wine program. And it was my first time writing a wine list and running a wine program and doing staff education. And um, I look back on it now and it's just so wild because I didn't have a ton of experience at the time, but um, somebody was willing to take a chance on me. <laughs> Well, t- tell me about that experience. I'm, mm. I'm curious about you know, how do you approach something like that when, when you're, you have nothing, no experience yeah. to fall back on? How do you approach building a wine list and what did you find worked well for you? Um, it's, I don't have a ton of like specific memories, um, but I do remember being um, really nervous. I remember. Um, wanting to be taken seriously and being very aware that I was a young woman doing something that, again, I had mostly experienced older men doing. Um, and so I, I was really, I think, at that time, very young in, in my career, very new, um, still learning a lot about wine and wanting people to take me seriously. And so um, what that led to was a lot of like ego in the wine list. And, um, you know, there was a lot, I put a lot of emphasis on making sure that like my point of view came across in the list. And now of course see that like, (laughs) if I could do it all over again, or if I know, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it very differently, but it also is like completely apt for the time that I was at in my life and what I knew, you know, and I didn't have a like, a restaurant mentor necessarily who showed me how to write a wine list. Like I had this amazing team of people that I got to work with and amongst when I was in Bend, but nobody who said like, this is how you write a wine list, you know? And so, um, so I kind of just had to like figure it out on my own. Um, and I think it went okay, actually. I hope it went okay. They didn't fire me, so (laughs) went okay. But you know, honestly, like I did have a lot of ego wrapped up in that list. There were wines that I felt really strongly about that I wanted to have. I wasn't necessarily conscious of like the customer base and what they wanted. And so, you know, there were definitely moments of like, um, well, we really need to have Stag's Leap and Rombauer on this list. Like that's what our customer wants and me saying, but I want to have this Oak Age to Sirtico instead. And that kind of tastes like Rombauer, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, it was a very interesting experience and I sort of like didn't numbers wise, I had someone to answer to, but otherwise I was just kind of on my own, you know? Um, and I stayed there for a while. I left to go take the job at New Seasons and to, um, work on the wine aisle with my now husband. Um, and that was just a happenstance situation where my, um, I, would go there and buy wine and um, I had been working at a different restaurant. I think this is how this happened. I'm not remembering my order. Been working at a different restaurant and um, 
Scott was in on a date having dinner and um, I didn't wait his t- I didn't take care of his table but I saw him at New Seasons like two days later on the wine aisle and I recognized him and I said oh this is kind of weird but were you at you were having dinner at um, Andina the other night that's where I was working you were having dinner at Andina the other night and he said yeah I was oh that's so interesting we just got to chit chatting and every time I would go in I would grab some wine and we would chit chat and um, this was back in the day where New Seasons you could just hire somebody who walked in the door and he said well I'm actually going to be hiring a new assistant to work the wine aisle Um, you know if you're interested you should apply for the job and um, so I did and I got hired and um, learned all about retail working at New Seasons on the wine aisle and we worked together for about a year and a half and um, just as friends, employer, employee. We didn't cross any boundaries. We were both in other relationships, in fact. And, um, but uh, it was a really, really awesome way to learn that end of the business and to learn really about um, buying, tasting, being like a responsible, respectful buyer. Um, and it was mentorship that I just like hadn't had yet. So I was really grateful for that. And then also like managing numbers, um, you know, looking at margin, you know, all of the things that I just like didn't really have much of a grasp on. And um, yeah, so that we did that together for about a year and a half. And then of course I left to go back to hospitality, (laughs) was calling my name, but, um, but yeah, it was, I think a, a really, really important part of my career. It's definitely informed like how I am as a buyer now by learning retail and kind of what I consider like the back end part of the business. What were the, the biggest uh, differences you noticed between selling wine in a restaurant as a SOM and building a wine list and selling wine retail at a place like New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like uh, in a restaurant you have more of a captured audience in a way um, because the list is only so long and um, you're really tailoring, if you're doing it the right way, you're really tailoring the list to complement a, a specific menu of food. Um, and again, like I said, you have this kind of captive audience. They're there, they're planning to spend money, they want something that's gonna be delicious that you know, may or may not go with the food. Not everybody cares about that, but may or may not go with the food, but will enhance their like experience, their evening. Whereas retail for me, you're talking to people about so many different, are you going home to have a quiet night by yourself? Are you taking this out to dinner? Are you having people over? Are you celebrating something? Um, And like that wine could go with anything or nothing, you know? Whereas in a restaurant, it's like very, I think it's so much more specific. Um, I feel like there's sort of, at least at the time in restaurants, there was this, like so much more formality too, um, that in retail you could kind of just like exhale and let some of that go, you know? Um, And I felt like too in retail for, in a lot of instances, people were more um, adventurous, Mm -hmm. I found. Now I would say that's very different in restaurants now for sure, but at that time when I was just starting, people weren't as adventurous. They kind of came in knowing what they wanted, how much, you know, they wanted to spend. Mm -hmm. And in retail, it felt like people were, could be swayed or talked into something or convinced, you know, and you had like so many more wines to look at and talk about. So it's kind of easier to like push people into something they might not be as comfortable with. So when you came back, when you, you mentioned hospitality is always pulling you back. Yeah. So when you came back into hospitality, then you, you had now you now you'd seen a lot of different things. You had seen wine from a lot of different mm-hmm. angles. So when you came back into hospitality, were you looking for something specific at that point, or what, what was it that brought you back into into that? The pace, without a doubt, the pace is what always kind of brought me back. Um, I like being busy and having lots of things to do, and I like that moment of like being in the weeds. <laughs> the hustle and being in the weeds and feeling like um, 
you and your team might not be able to hold it together to get through whatever this push is and then within you know a minute everybody's breathing easy again I don't just we're all gluttons for punishment but there's something about that I think also just the camaraderie of like we're all doing this together you know um but it, again it was like the the entirety of the experience like providing an experience for people I just so connect to and um wanting to do that for people um so yeah I think I just wanted that back in my life plain and simple like it was fine you know loading beer and wine onto a cart and bringing it down to the grocery store aisle and stocking it and then sometimes the aisle would be busy and you could answer some questions about wine but it wasn't you know just as constant as like a night on the floor in a restaurant where you're it's like just problem solving and keeping the ship afloat and also having a great time and um yeah i definitely needed that so when you came back into it, was that in a, in a restaurant setting then? Was that your next step? Yep. So restaurant setting. So that, I got things a little bit out of order. So that's when I went to 23 Hoyt. I opened 23 Hoyt and um, did that and um, had that first, like, you know, on the job wine buying experience. Um, and I did that, like I said, for about a year and a half and then left there and went to work for a wine distributor. And what prompted that? That's an interesting move. That was, it's a very interesting move and not something that I was necessarily looking for, but um, a very dear, dear friend of mine um, had worked at this specific distributor, which doesn't exist anymore in Portland, um, and was getting ready to move on and basically reached out and said, you don't realize this, but you've kind of been on a job interview during your whole time as the wine director at 23 Hoyt and we really like what you do and the wines that you're interested in and would you, you know, be, would you consider um, coming to work, you know, at this company? And um, I hadn't thought about it at all, but it was, I was so um, blown away that somebody, you know, had taken that kind of interest in the work that I was doing. Um, and it also was sort of a validation of like, okay, I'm, I'm on the right track here. You know, and the portfolio for this um, distributor was amazing. I mean, it was I was buying a lot of wine from them, but it was just full of all of like the best natural wine importers. And um, at that, that's when I had really started to dive into natural wine. And so it just felt like an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Um, again, there was also the like, oh, that's a side of the business that I don't know and I can't. I, f I felt like I can't not know it, you know, like how can I do, do my job on this side? Cause I, I really, I always think of like distribution and buying as a partnership and a dance and how can you like be in the partnership and do the dance if you only know one side of it, you know? Um, it was the same way as I always recommended that people that work front of house in a restaurant should work back of house and vice versa so that you have that picture of like, oh, okay, so we're all on a team, even though we feel divided, right? And we all have very specific jobs it's really, really hard to understand the other side if you haven't done their job before. So I think there was part of me too that was like, I think, you know, this probably only has a benefit by going to do this, even though it's not hospitality, but I could learn that side of the business and how cool to be able to sell all of these wines, you know, from natural winemakers that I love. So, so that was my foray into distribution, importing and distribution. And how did you like it? Uh, I didn't, I, you know, I, and I say that like it with like <laughs> a lot of humor behind it because, um, I, I did it and I learned so much and I got to travel and I worked, you know, with, with somebody who's be, you know, also become one of my dearest friends through that business. So there were like so many positives, but, um, it was really obvious to me pretty quickly that I didn't like going out and trying to convince people to buy wine, which is strange because that's what I was doing in a restaurant, right? But again, you just have this like captive audience where I felt like with wholesale, you're just going and like competing against all these other people that are also trying to sell wine. Um, I just don't think I was very good at it. And maybe I wasn't good at it because I didn't enjoy it. Um, but I just have so much respect for people who have been in sales for decades 
and are incredible at it because that's just not me at all. And I knew, I knew pretty early on that I wasn't enjoying it and um, I don't take rejection well. So going and showing you know, somebody a bag of wines and walking away with not selling anything. Um, of course, now I understand like there's so many reasons behind that. Like their shelves are full, they don't need that. They already tasted 10 Rhone wines in the past two weeks. They don't need the two Rhone wines that I have. Like there's all kinds of reasons why it happens. But for me, it was just like rejection all the time, rejection. And I just don't deal well with that. So I felt just like a deflated balloon most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Before we go on to the next step, I'm curious, you mentioned uh, kind of a growing affinity for natural wine mm-hmm. at this point, and obviously uh, Scott and, and Bow and Arrow making, making natural wine. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about what it was that mm. appealed to you about it and, mm. and what you saw that was kind of the forefront of the, of the term natural yeah. wine, at least, if not the idea of natural for sure. wine. Uh, what did you see uh, as a consumer and as a buyer and as a seller of natural wine at that point that was uh, attractive to you and, 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 and that was sort of growing uh, yeah. as the trend was growing? Um, I mean, I think the main thing that struck me in, in the beginning was that um, it was so new, although like it wasn't new in Europe, but, but the, the sort of idea that there were other kinds of wines in the world that spoke more to um, their terroir and uh, winemaking philosophy was so interesting and cool to me. Like honestly, it was just very cool. I was like, that's cool, and I want to like, more know, know more about that and be more involved in it, um, which sounds so petty now when I say it, but I mean, it's the truth. I just, I, I think it was just like, well, that's other, and I'm interested in other. Um, like, I'm not the white man in a suit selling wine, the older white guy in a suit selling wine, you know, clearly. Um, and so what else is out there? Where, what, what's my angle? What's my thing? Um, And then, of course, like the philosophies around it just really resonated with me. Like, how can farming better be bad for anybody? And how can less intervention in wine be bad? Um, And, I mean, I loved the rebellious nature of so many of the winemakers at that time. Really, like, pushing boundaries and kind of giving the bird to AOC and the DOC and just like doing what they wanted to do. It just was so cool. Just wanted to be part of it. Truth be told. I appreciate that. I, appreciate that. <laughs> I wish I had a more like poetic reason, <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, obviously you, you didn't go away from it. So you found, you obviously yep. found something there with, with redeeming value yeah. for yourself. So I yeah. It's been um, a really kind of special wave to ride, and it's interesting to see like how this philosophy in wine has ebbed and flowed over the years and changed. And I don't necessarily like love where it is right now either, um, but I am really proud to sort of like hang my hat on wines that are grown and made that way, and support winemakers that are. Are good are good stewards of this land. Um, I'm really really grateful to be a part of it for sure. So, what point does Bar Norman become part of part of your life? So, Bar Norman, I mean, it, in its like actual physicality, um, July will be four years um, that we open the bar. But I think Bar Norman came to be. Um, earlier than that, when I kind of had felt like I had done all the things, you know, I, after leaving distribution, was back to restaurants um, and was in restaurants for a number of years running wine programs at um, different places, um, which, you know, all of which have closed at this point. But um, uh, Ava Jeans is still open, so that's not true. Um, but I, you know, did a, a Austrian German mountain wine list at Tusk and I did a um, kind of a coastal and island wine list at Riffle and then um, did the program at Ava Jeans and was there for three years and that was deeply heavily Italian only Italian um, and that was another kind of self-exploration journey um, learning all about Italy and I think by that point I had just realized that I had done the things that I was going to do for other people. I've always been really risk adverse. 
um, which sounds strange when I think about like wanting to challenge myself to do things that I think are impossible. Um, but there is a part of me that's, that's risk averse. And I think that, you know, when it comes to like finances and business and things like that, but I didn't see where else I was going to go. You know, I did, I couldn't find what the next thing was going to be other than to have my own thing. And I knew after so many years in restaurants, it wasn't going to be a restaurant, um, that it was going to be something small and something deeply personal. Um, and I, uh, was going to, or partnered in another restaurant project and left after a really short time. Um, I just realized that no matter how much I had worked and what I was putting into it, it wasn't going to be my project and it was more than I ever wanted it to be. And, um, it was a really hard lesson. One of the hardest lessons I've ever learned in my life was saying yes to it. Something that I knew in my soul was something I should have said no to. Um, but this little glimmer of like, it wasn't bar Norman at the time, but this little small thing that I wanted to do that was going to be my own stayed with me, um, through that project. And, um, so when I left there, I just said, that's it. Enough is enough. I'm done with restaurants. I'm done working for other people and we're get, we have to figure out how to make this happen. Um, and it really came to be like with a lot of encouragement from Scott um, because I think he believed in me more than I believed in myself. My family um, was just incredibly supportive also and um, some really close friends who you know, convinced me to show them my pitch deck and um, kind of sh share my ideas and um, they helped really coach me through doing it as well. And um, yeah, and it really, of all of the things I've done in my career, this is just my most favorite. And I've had a lot of highlights, a lot of things that I'm super proud of, but this, I think because it is so personal, it just, I, I never want to leave this place. Yeah. So take us through the, the kind of initial concept to, to, to completion. Mm -hmm. what, what, what you mentioned, some, something small, something personal, mm -hmm. something that's you. So how does that translate into this? Yeah. So I knew that it was going to be wine only. It wasn't going to be beer and cocktails. Um, I knew that I wanted it to feel like it had been here for a long time, but also not feel like an antique store, you know? So something that was like lived in and comfortable. Um, and I didn't have any money, really. I had hardly any money. And so it was something that had to be very like scrappy. You know, all of the chairs and tables um, for the most part were like thrifted and second ha secondhand finds and, um, you know, plants that we brought from my house. And, you know, it just, the stools came from a, like a school warehouse company, you know, they look like, um, they're all upstairs right now, but they look like, um, like your physics classroom, you know, science classroom stools. So it was, it, it, I knew it had to be scrappy, but I also felt like that would kind of contribute to the like lived in feel. And that also, um, said to me that it would feel more accessible. And that was really important is how, I think that's where I was mostly at in my career at that point was like also how do we make wine feel more accessible to people because we've gotten so far away from that um, especially in natural wine and when I when I first got into natural wine what I think you know another thing that I loved about it it was just like so renegade and out there and like I would go to tastings and the winemakers would be there and they're like Carhartt overalls like there was nobody there in like a suit or a tie or a you know and um, there, there was this accessibility to it that even like me, a young woman, could be into those kinds of wines. Whereas um, there were a lot of wines that I felt like there's no way. If I'm not in the right circle, I'm not drinking those wines. And so the goal for me after many years and seeing sort of like the hype behind natural wine and the money behind natural wine was like, how do we bring this back down a couple notches and make it more accessible? Which doesn't mean like it's not exciting and it's not part of like the movement, but just making it so that lots of different people can drink the wines, enjoy the wines, feel comfortable in this kind of space. So, um, so that, that was really sort of the feeling is like, how do you do it and make it sort of feel like you're in someone's living room hanging out with them? Um, and so we did things 
like with our bar we didn't build in a back bar so there's no like ice bin back there there's no well like we didn't need it because we weren't making cocktails but also for me every bar you sit at you have all those things keeping you and the person behind the bar like eight feet away from each other and so for us it's just the bar top is the only distance and so it really allows you to like be conversational with people to kind of hang out rather than like I'm here and you're the way all the way over there. So some things like that, that were just really intentional as a way to make the space feel cozy, keeping it small. Um, so, you know, there's only so many places to sit, but you can also stand and it feels, you know, like a, like a party in a lot of ways. So, um, um, I had always loved this building. And um, when I started looking for spaces, the broker that I was working with took me to see a couple spaces in con like new construction. And I had said like, definitely not interested. I need something with character. It's just every house I've lived in is like old, charming character. I like old things that are worn in, that have a story. And um, she, I think like a couple weeks after working together, mentioned to me that this space was available. And I said, you have no idea for like, 10 years I've driven by this building on Clinton and said that would be the perfect place if we ever did a bar anything like that I would love to be in this building so I basically told her like how do we make it happen and it turned out no I think yeah and it turned out she was the leasing agent on the space yeah so it was really like a super amazing situation that worked out and I could never ever ever leave the space never I love it so much I love being in this building I love the neighborhood, you know, it just, it was funny when we walked in here the first time I was like, this is perfect. The lighting is amazing. The bar can go here. People can see here. And Scott walked in and was like, the sound system's going to be amazing in here. You've got to have priorities. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, okay, we know we found the space. <laughs> But it's true. It's true. It's sort of like fit the bill. Like Bar Norman is, you know, as with Bow and Arrow and Delicious is like we own the businesses together. But like Delicious and, and Bow and Arrow are Scott's side of the business and Bar Norman is my side of the business. And so we like support and respect each other, but also like stay out of each other's way, you know. So I was like, you come in and do the music and get that all set up and then I'll do the rest of it. Well, so it worked out great that we both like felt good about the space and. So tell me about uh, about sort of the naming and branding of the site mm. and, and then about opening it and, and yeah. kind of what your expectations were. Mm -hmm. So Norman is my grandfather um, on my mom's, my mom's dad. And um, he uh, wasn't like a wine guy. It's not like the reason I got into wine. Um, but he was European, um, Austrian, and always enjoyed a glass of wine with dinner. And um, when I was thinking about what to call the bar, I had a list of like what I knew it wasn't going to be. It wasn't going to be a name or a word that was hard to pronounce or a foreign word for sure. I didn't want it to be something that was hard to pronounce. I didn't want it to be anything related to wine at all. I didn't want it to be anything cliche. And um, I was thinking about it and I was like, Norman is just such like an everyday working man name, you know? Um, it wasn't his given name, it's the name that he um, chose when he um, escaped the Nazis and came to the States. He changed his name to Norman. Um, and he was, in, in my life, we were very close. Um, and he lived until 2010, so 13 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, anyway, he had just um, instilled in like my family this idea of perseverance, um, like his whole life, and um, just like making the best with what you have. And um, those were things that I just felt really attached to, um, like this idea, like you don't stop. If there's something you enjoy, you keep doing it, um, and just always like things could always be worse. <laughs> You know, I think when you survive a tragedy like the Holocaust, like, of course, things could always be worse. Mm -hmm. So that was just how he lived his life. Um, he worked really, really, really hard for everything that he had and was very proud of of the work that he put in. And um, so those were all things that just have stuck with me my whole life and really resonated. And so it was like, 
I can't think of a better name for this place than like a name that everyone can pronounce, you know, um, and someone who really inspired me in my life. So, so I have his pictures up on the wall of him from the time he was a little boy through adulthood. There's a picture of him with my mom and with my grandmother. And so, yeah. So, um, and you asked me about when, when I opened, oh, like, you, yeah. What, what, what were your expectations and, and, and sort of how did it go getting started? You know, I felt very calm and very resolved because I'd opened at this point so many restaurants. Like, I'd been on numerous opening team restaurants. I had, like I said, the previous project I was working on had worked on from construction all the way through hiring and opening. And so I felt really like, resolved and calm about that part of things like bringing on a team and getting the logistics in place um it was more just like will people come will they like it are they gonna be are they gonna be into what i did and and so much of 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 building bar norman was like i'm just gonna create the kind of place that i would want to hang out at and then hope that other people want to hang out there too you know and so um yeah so there were just a lot of nerves i think People came, but there were a lot of nerves. The other thing that really threw a wrench into things is that I was writing my book. and um, Or I wasn't writing it at the time. The book was done, and my book, um, it was published within like a month of the bar opening. And so my co-author and I were also planning book events all over the country. And we did a basically like a month-long book tour around the country. And I left on tour um, about like... Four, four weeks after the bar opened, six weeks after the bar opened, left on tour. So that was stressful. <laughs> would not do that again. Would not recommend. I'm going to come back to the book in a second, but I'm, I'm curious. Um, obviously, you had, you, had, you had done a lot of wine at this point, a lot mm-hmm. of wine from a lot of different angles, a lot of wine lists. Tell me about now that you have your own thing. Yeah. You're completely in control. Mm-hmm. How do you build a wine list when it's just you? Um, well... This is a good question. I'm trying to think back of what the initial, what we did initially. Um, So the idea was to offer lots of different wines, natural wines, of course, from all over the world. We weren't, I never wanted to be very specific to one part of the world because I wanted to represent what's great about natural wine all over. Um, And um, I wanted the wines to sort of represent, in my mind, when I'm thinking of like, we were pouring like 25 wines when we opened, was like, how do we get lots of different grape varieties, different styles of wine, different expressions of maybe the same grape variety, um, different parts of the world. And so it was sort of like putting together, it was like a Tetris a little bit to figure out what fits where. And um, of course, you know, so many favorite wines and not enough room for all of them. So the philosophy was like, we're just gonna, excuse me, switch it up so that, you know, nothing gets stagnant and we're constantly like rotating new wines in. So if you come in, you know, two times in three weeks, you get to taste a bunch of different wines, Mm -hmm. trying to keep pricing as accessible as possible. Um, For me, I just really wanted to have like $10 glasses of wine and $11 glasses of wine. And unfortunately that's just like not reality anymore with inflation, but um, that was really a big goal at the beginning too. So, um, and then the other thing for me that was really important was really kind of sharing the wealth amongst the different distributors that I work with again, thinking in terms of like partnership so that nothing was weighted so heavily to one distributor or another, but really trying to like, yeah, spread the love around. Let's talk about COVID. Yeah. Uh, Everyone's favorite subject. You're just, you're just getting started (laughs) and and COVID hits. So, uh, so what are the, what is kind of the initial reaction and and what adjustments did you make Mm -hmm. to kind of get through the past couple of years? So the initial reaction was, oh shit. (laughs) What are we going to do? Um, How do we stay afloat? What do we do about our team? It was a lot of worry. A lot of worry. Um, So we've always had, we've always poured wine by the glass. and We've never had like a bottle list, but we have this retail shelf where the wines are available for takeaway or for drinking here. If you wanted to have a bottle, you could do something by the glass as a bottle, but also just pull something off the retail shelf and then we just do a $10 corkage. So um, what we, and what we, so what we did is we launched um, immediately when the 
um, pandemic started and we knew that we needed money still coming in the door and we weren't sure like I mean I remember if I look back my first text that I sent our team was like okay we're going to be closed for two or three weeks and then we'll reassess and obviously like we were closed for almost 18 months um but just like not having any idea at that time. So we launched, I didn't have like an online platform at all for selling wine or anything. So I basically went on to Squarespace, which hosts my website and created like a way to have not a full real retail shop, but we did, um, we launched what was called quarantine quaffers. And so every week I would choose like a curated selection of six to eight wines and offer them up basically for 24 hours. So it was like a 24 hour sale of those wines. People could go online, choose the wines, they could come pick them up or have them delivered. And it was just a way to like get wine to people while everyone was stuck at home and also just like have a little bit of revenue coming in while we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do. And 18 months later, we were still doing quarantine coiffers. We kept it going almost the whole time. So every week um, for, the, for that first 18 months, offering wines up for people for pickup and delivery. Um, we eventually opened last winter um, just for retail. So we basically moved all the tables and chairs out of the front space and converted it into like a small retail space. So we stacked wines on the bench. We did case stacks along this wall. We made like a little makeshift like cash, you know, checkout table right here. And so we operated as a retailer and we did gift boxes at the holidays and um, continued doing coiffers and that sustained us and basically went down to myself and like one part-time um, team member and that sustained us and then we um, built the our patio outside um, this last spring so almost a year ago and reopened after 18 months for outside seating only on the patio um, and then we opened for inside seating once the weather started tanking like late fall, early winter this year. So that's the evolution. So now we're fully open inside and outside. And we still do great retail sales because that really actually took off for us during the pandemic. So we do have a lot more people stopping in now just to like grab bottles on their way home from work, um, stocking up for the weekend for vacations, things like that. So that was like a real positive out of the pandemic for us. Um, and took a break like once summer hit we were so 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 busy with outside seating and events and things like that that we took a break from quarantine coiffers but we brought them back now we just call them coiffers because we're trying to move on from the quarantine but um but it's a fun way to like offer wine to people i for myself don't love going to shop for wine online and scrolling through pages and pages and pages and pages of wines and there's not descriptions about the wines and it's just like it can be very overwhelming even for someone who works in the industry so my thought was if we curate it and make it more as like a almost like a personal shopping experience so that you know folks are looking at six wines or eight wines instead of 400 and each of those wines has a description and maybe like what we would pair it with if we were cooking or you know, drink now or save it, you know, that kind of stuff that you would want if you walked into a shop. So um, we're still doing that, which is fun. But I imagine again, by summer, it'll be gone because we'll be too busy. But yeah, I feel extremely lucky that we survived. And it's still um, like a month to month situation right now. It's still really, really challenging. I won't say that it's just going swimmingly. Um, but I feel grateful to even have made it to where we are. So then assuming a, a somewhat forward trajectory now and, 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 and back to kind of where you're able to kind of dictate what you want it to mm -hmm. be and what you want to do, what do you see going forward? What, what, what are your kind of hopes for next, for next steps here? Um, I mean, it feels silly to say it, but like my biggest hope is just to get back to like where we were before we closed. And I say that with a bunch of caveats because we've had, we've made some really positive changes um, here like within the business itself and as a team but also like as a community and so there's a lot of things that I don't think should go back to how they were before but as far as like if we're just looking at the business and the type of place that we um, want to be in the space we want to like host for people that is like that's the forward trajectory and like not really changing a whole lot 
um, changing things for the positive, sure, but like I don't want to open another bar. Not interested in like a second location in another part of town um, or in a different city. Like I just have spent my whole life working so hard for other people and I really appreciate having this thing that's my own that's really small, it's manageable. We're a team of five. We all really like each other and communicate really well. And um, so I just don't, I don't want to screw it up. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know? What are some of the, you mentioned kind of the positive changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of the positive changes that have come out of the past couple of years for you? Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting because before we um, closed, we had almost an entirely different team working here at the bar. And, you know, over 18 months, like, people move, people go back to school. So like the team changed almost top to bottom. Um, But everyone who had ever worked here told me how much this place meant to them and, and what working here, like how fulfilling it was for them, how much they enjoyed it, the relationships that they made that they felt like, you know, were lifetime relationships. And that meant a lot to me um, to know that, that we had as like this small little group fostered, um, a place that people really liked coming to work. Mm -hmm. So I always held that like really closely, like this is a good place to work, you know? And I hear that from the people who are working here. It's not just me myself being like, well, this feels good to me. (laughs) Um, But I recognized within that, that there was still work that we could do to make it a better, like more equitable place to work. And so I spent a good chunk of time thinking about like what kinds of things I wanted to change and how we were gonna implement them. So um, the first thing was um, paying our team more, a higher hourly wage. Um, and that, that went into effect right away once we reopened. Um, we were already offering health benefits for full-time employees, so we continue to do that. Um, we also made changes to um, the decision-making processes within the business. So any like major financial decisions I still make, um, but my books are completely open now. So the staff has the ability to see our profit and loss. They have the ability to to see our entire payroll. So our whole um, payroll system is open so they can see what everyone on the team is making, including myself. Um, And it feels like you know, we're just all in a very equal playing field because of that. There's no questions about um, who's being paid, what, for what reason. If, um, like, we have one of our team members does our social media, and so um, she just gets a bonus for the social media. It's not based on anything related to the social media. It's just a bonus for doing the social media. And so that was, like, shared with a team you know, because this person is managing social media now, they're going to be making this much as a bonus. So it's just a very open dialogue all the time. Um, we do a quarterly check-in with everyone. That's not a review, but just a like, we want to sit down, hear how you're doing, how are things working for you, share some P&L numbers. Um, and then a lot of the day-to-day kind of decisions we make together Um we either take to a vote, we have a group discussion, or the staff will just decide. Um, and that could be like, hey, it feels like from 10 to 11 in the evening is pretty slow. How do you all feel if we like start closing at 10 o'clock, or would you still like to stay open till 11? And we had a really great, fruitful discussion about like t- cutting an hour off. What does that do to people's hours for, for their income, but also like for their mental health of not being here till midnight, closing up a bar when it's not actually that busy? Um, everything COVID related we've talked about and decided as a group. So wearing masks, checking vaccine cards, having stools at the bar top, like that was, has all been decided as a group opposed to me just making the decision. So, um, and we've really kind of tried to spread out responsibility to among the staff. So I'm not just like taking it all on and it's not expected that because I'm the owner, I'm the boss, I should do all of the things, but, um, you know, there are ways, I think, to allow people the opportunity to grow within a business, even if, like, their goal isn't to be a wine director or own a wine bar, but um, to have the opportunity to learn things that they could take out in other ways in their life, you know, and so that's, I think, so much 
more of the philosophy now than it was pre-pandemic. Um, and it's working great. I think that when we give a team the ability to feel like they're on a team and not just an employee, um, when you give your staff that opportunity, um, like it can't be bad. That's how I feel. It really can't be bad. And sometimes the team will make a decision that maybe isn't like the choice I would make, but it's okay because we all support each other. I think truly there's only been one time, and it was a very funny moment um, in the last couple weeks where we couldn't come to a group consensus about what we were going to do. Something very benign, like where are we going to keep the fruit for our Amaro and vermouth? And nobody could decide. And so I finally was like, all right, I'm just going to call it. I'm just going to decide. But it was hilarious because that hasn't happened at all, you know, where like I've just had to like make a decision. You know, it was like I said, a very benign thing, but I laughed because I was like, I can't believe this is the thing that I'm like putting my stake on the ground and is like where the fruit, where the citrus is going to go for the vermouth, you know. It'll be, your but, leg- it'll be your legacy. I know, exactly. That's what I'm known for. <laughs> but um, I'm actually getting ready to take um, like an extended period of time off and um, the team is going to run the bar and... It's awesome. I'm not worried. I have like lots of Jewish guilt, my own personal Jewish guilt about leaving them, but not about them like running the bar and taking care of guests. And I think it's great. It's awesome. So you, you obviously you mentioned hospitality as a, as a the, the kind of the through line for you mm-hmm. and I was pulling you back. I'm curious, how would you define hospitality what, what does it mean to you and, and what how do you try to portray it through your work here yeah um I think it's really um hospitality is like being in service of others and taking care taking care of people um and the way that that we um kind of demonstrate that here is just through like absolute like genuine warmth and welcoming Um, and really making sure that this thing that is so intimidating to so many people doesn't feel intimidating. And that, in this particular circumstance, is like the definition of hospitality, is how do we treat somebody who knows a lot about wine, maybe is a winemaker or works in in the industry who comes in here, how do we treat that person the same as somebody who comes in who only knows that they don't like Riesling, but they don't really know anything else about wine, or thinks that the only red grape they like is Sangiovese, and they don't want to drink anything else, you know? Um, It's treating everybody the same, and um, we just, like, we do it by kind of just, like, avoiding a lot of wine talk, to be honest. Like, we can get down and nerdy with, like, the best of them, but it's just not really the way we connect with people. Um... And I mean that, like, in the broad sense of how people connect with people is not through, like, super nerdy, like, out factoiding each other, you know? But it's through, like, just being real people. And so that is very much the philosophy and the way we express hospitality here is, like, welcome in. How is your day? What are you up to? You know, um, what do you like drinking? You know, things that are just, like, questions that... I think anybody feels comfortable here answering, you know. Um, we're very good about telling people if they ask us about a wine and we don't have the information saying, like, I don't know. Our team is really great about somebody comes in and asks about a wine on the board, but they haven't worked for two days, saying, oh, you know, I just got in and I haven't worked for a couple of days. I haven't tasted that wine either. Why don't we taste it together? And then I can kind of tell you, give you some of my thoughts about it rather than trying to out knowledge people I think when you put yourself on the same level um, as your guests it automatically p- puts people at ease mm-hmm. automatically puts people at ease and so that's really that's where our like center of gravity lies in hospitality mm-hmm. it's being here and meeting people where they're at some people come in and they're on a date. They don't want to be real chit-chatty with us. They just want to, like, get their wine and go sit down and be on their date. And some people want to come up and, like, break down a wine. And they want to know all the things. And we can do whatever people, you know, we can do all those things. But it's always done with warmth. So you mentioned earlier, just to totally change topics, so you mentioned your book. 
and you mentioned releasing your book at a very opportune moment in your business life. <laughs> tell me about... I didn't get a choice in that tell either. Me, tell me about the, the, the book, the project, yeah. what, how it came about, and, and, and yeah. sort of take us through creating it. So my dear, dear friend, Andrea Sloniker, is a cookbook author and um, culinary creative. She does amazing food styling and recipe development and um, uh, all sorts of um, culinary projects here, but all over the country. And um, we knew each other just through the business, through the industry. Um, her husband, um, Tom Monroe, a division is was friends of ours. And so we've just like known each other through the circle. And um, she, uh, gosh, what happened? A mutual friend invited us both to lunch to celebrate the um, release of, at that time, Andrea's newest book, which is a book called Beer Bites. And it was all um, that she did with Christian De Benedetti. Um, that was uh, beer and food pairings with Andrea's recipes. And I remember heading to that lunch going, oh, I wonder if there's a Wine Bites. That would be kind of cool to do. I don't know anything about writing a book, but I did study journalism in college, so like maybe I could pull it off. And we go to have this lunch with a mutual friend and drink some wine at lunch, and we were just chit-chatting around, and this sort of like came up, like, is there a Wine Bites book? And literally that just like was the beginning of the conversation, and we just decided we should go for it. Um, we had another mutual friend who um, is a wine writer and publisher in New York City. And we reached out to her and she said, you'll never believe this, but I was just talking with an editor friend of mine who's looking for a new wine book. And um, so we didn't even actually have to like take our um, proposal and shop it. We basically just got like hooked up with this badass editor in New York. Um, and we ended up, um, so wrote, wrote the proposal, um, had the proposal accepted, got our book deal, and started working on it. It was a three-year project beginning to end. And um, we worked with a team of all women, which was really, really awesome. So our editor, our photographer, our prop stylist, um, the whole creative team on the book design end, every single person was female. So it was a pretty awesome coincidence and very cool. And um, yeah, and through that process, we just became such close friends. Um, and we did every part of the book together. So we developed all the recipes together. We did all the writing together. Um, we styled um, the book. So it was really like a very, again, very like personal project. And then we took a one month book tour around the country. We just really went for it. <laughs> Well, what was the what was the reception? Um, you know, like I think on the grand market, I don't know what the reception was. I didn't really follow it that well, but like um, everywhere we went, that we had tour stops and we did events and stuff like that, the reception was fantastic. And it actually, Andrea and I still send messages to each other when we see the book out in the wild. Like, <laughs> oh my god, it's so weird! I can't believe it's still out here. You know, because it's been like f almost four years since it came out. Um, but it it's uh i think people have really enjoyed it and it was a really fun way again like trying to make wine more accessible I, I don't think it's like the most accessible wine book out there by any means but the goal was to like take more kind of unknown obscure grape varieties and regions and pair them with food because every book that we had looked at for like um when we were writing the proposal we kind of wanted to see what else was on the market was kind of the same like pinot noir and salmon and Pinot Grigio with this and Cabernet with steak and you know it was just sort of the same and so we were like all right how, how are we going to mix this up and um, so like what can we pair with Alianico and what can we pair with Petnat and skin contact wines and Georgian wines and Sicilian wines and um, so it was really really fun really fun. Did you find from that from that aspect was that mostly just trial and error on your on your behalf was it most or were you getting input from other people or was it mostly just like we have this wine what does it go with how do we how do we kind of create we, it? it went from both so what, basically what we did is we sat down and we thought of and I don't think it was in a particular order but we thought of like wines that we really love that we would want to include and not even specific wineries but like grape varieties or regions where like oh we've never really seen anybody cover 
Greek wines. Like let's do a really cool like Greek white. And if we were drinking Greek white wine, what would we want to have with that? Oh, like definitely some kind of fish or seafood. And then on the flip side of that, we also were like, we need to do this recipe. And what is the wine that goes with that recipe? Like, how do we make the most, like what's our ultimate chicken pot pie recipe? Cause that's just not, who talks about wine pairing with chicken pot pie? But who doesn't love chicken pot pie? So like, what's the ultimate wine pairing for that? Or like, oh, we really wanted to do, um, you know, like a Sunday sauce, like Italian American Sunday sauce. So yeah, well, we know Italian red wine goes for that, but like how let's specifically look like, what can we talk about there? So it was kind of both ways. Then there were, you know, once we had those ideas mapped out and we started sort of loosely putting them into like what we would think would be chapters, then we could look at the holes and be like, oh, in the like, um, you know, picnics and other reasons to eat outdoors, we don't have enough vegetable recipes or we don't have anything that's actually done over a live fire. Like we should do that. So we would sort of like fill in like that. Again, it was very like Tetris-y. <laughs> then ideas that got scrapped, you know, that kind of thing. Not everything makes the cut, but. Would you do it again? I would do any project again with Andrea. I would do another book if I got paid a bunch of money. Does that answer those <laughs> questions? Um, as is probably known to a lot of people, there's just very little money in book publishing unless you are a name, like a real name. Um, and it's just, it's so, I mean, it was three years of my life and doing that also while doing this, it just like the balance sheet at the end was very askew. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, this also just went into that category of like things that I want to challenge myself to do. Like there's no way I could have my name on a published book. And then, you know, I was able to like see myself through the entire process. So the whole, the process was amazing. Working with Andrea was amazing. Um, I'm so, so proud of what we did. I just don't know if my family would keep me if I wrote another book. <laughs> I don't know if they would keep me. You have to ask Scott. But um, no, it's just like an, it, a really intense sacrifice. If that's what you're focused on, if that's all you're doing, but also like opening a new business, running a bar. At that time, our daughter was six. You know, it was a lot. It was a lot. So I could see myself doing it again in a different context of my life, for sure. Um, and I would like do anything with Andrea. If she asked me to do it with her, I would do it. So. It's a fantastic answer. I love that. <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> it's very true. So I want to talk about the kind of the Oregon wine industry a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, from kind of a broad perspective. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Uh, biggest changes you've seen from your perspective. Obviously, you have a very unique perspective. You've seen it from all the different yeah. angles. What are the biggest changes in the industry that, you, that you've seen, and what does the industry look like to you now mm -hmm. in 2022? I mean, climate change is obviously very, very, very big. The climate crisis is um, certainly having an impact on us on the West Coast. I mean, all over the place, but on the West Coast. And so that's a big change. Um, I think, you know, the other, I, said, I guess I would say that's a, uh, of concern. And I think the other thing that is of concern is kind of the influx of, um, of, money and maybe like non-Oregon interests entering the Oregon wine industry. Um, and I, yeah, I have feelings, excuse me, about that because um, I, I love our wine industry the way it has been. I like it being small and quaint and farmy and not Napa. Um, and I, see that we have a like slower trajectory going in that direction than, than Napa had, but I also see that starting to creep and happen. And, um, you know, I, I don't wish that for, for the Oregon wine industry. Um, I also understand that money is involved and money talks and, you know, it's, it's the world's challenge, you know? Um, so those are, I think, for me, like when I look at a span of, you know, like almost 20 years in the business of, you know, seeing those are the big kind of factors. Um, I think what's exciting is, is the number of young people that are pushing the boundaries 
and trying to like find new ways to grow grapes and make wine with the climate, you know, with the climate crisis and with a lot of money um, coming up that could kind of stifle the potential to buy fruit from certain vineyards and, um, you know, have access to, to affordable ways of making wine. Um, but it's still really exciting to me. Um, and I'm grateful for people that are, you know, pushing boundaries and trying new things. Um, I think that once we kind of took a long pause and said, oh, Oregon is like Burgundy and this is Pinot and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris country. Um, I think that, that there was a real purpose for that for a long time, but then I think we got stagnant. And so it's been really, really nice over the years to see people just curious about what else can grow here and like, how do we adapt with the climate and how do we change how we're farming um, in order to do better and to make um, wine and wine growing more accessible to more people. Um, so that's a really kind of exciting, I think, aspect of, of what's happening in Oregon. Where do you think it goes from here? You tell me, you've talked to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like 600 different answers. Exactly, exactly. Um, I don't know. I wish I felt more positive at this moment about where it goes, but I do think um, we have to look really closely at like how much more our environment can bear and what that's going to mean for our industry. I think we have to look really closely at how we value um, the bodies that are making wine and growing grapes um, and how we um, kind of make some real fundamental changes to how we treat um, seasonal vineyard workers and people that work in cellars and wineries. Um, and I just, I know that we're, I know that there are people that are working on it that are on the path. I just don't know if it's like enough and like with enough emphasis, if that makes sense. I don't have like a negative feeling necessarily, but I don't, I, also don't have a like everything's gonna be great sort of like that's not the vibe right now I mean maybe if we would have talked three years ago pre-pandemic I might feel differently but um, I think the pandemic has just shed a lot of light on the holes and the inadequacies within our industry and um, like you know we've got to make some really big changes so I guess that's where we go from here we start making some changes have you seen any changes? Do you see anything along those lines? Um, you know, I'm hearing of things here and there that, you know, people are, are trying to, um, you know, do the good work to um, bring awareness to um, both farming from an environmental standpoint and farming from a humanitarian standpoint. And so, yeah, I'm seeing that. I... I um, Mimi Castile is like a dear old friend of mine. I used to work at Bethel Heights and um, she's like my personal hero. <laughs> Love her. Um, but I see the work that she's doing or I see what the type of farming Kelly Fox is doing. And I feel really like hopeful in that way. And there's a lot of promise. We just need people to listen to those women and like see that the work that they're doing um, is essential. Um, and it's, it's, it can, it can change and it can help, but people have to listen, mm -hmm. you know. And what's next for you? We talked about here a little bit. So uh, mm. what's, what's on your kind of future agenda? Are there things you're hoping to do, things you're planning to do? Uh, Bar Norman is it. That's it for now. Considered opening a um, retail space, also like an accompanying retail space. There's no money in retail, but, um, you know, just like thinking about what we've built here. We have like a very robust wine club. We have people that have come to know us for retail over the last couple of years. And so, you know, I've toyed with like, mm, if we space came up next door, would we open a retail shop kind of situation? But um, I don't really see any big moves. 
this is going to stay what it is. I like it. It's very manageable. Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing for myself personally that came out of the pandemic was realizing that I'm just like never going to work as, as many hours as I was working before. And so uh, my future just looks a lot like work-life balance, lots of time with my family and my loved ones and, um, and, you know, less hours working. I don't feel bad about it. Or should you? <laughs> a very common theme of our recent interviews, yeah, I would say. Yeah, good. It's nice to like not be alone in that boat. <laughs> you know, we had to learn something, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. All the questions that I have for you, awesome. is there anything Thank I didn't you. ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should cover? So. All right. It was awesome. great. It was so nice to visit. Awesome. And yeah, for us, thank too, thank you. thank you so much for sharing thanks. your story with Appreciate us and it. sharing your space. Yeah, thank you. Let's you off the hook. Thank you. Thank you.